Hello and welcome to the Be Real, Get Real podcast. I am Nancy Matthews, and it's a pleasure to be here with you today sharing real stories of real women and how they're making an impact in the world, regardless of the circumstances that brought them to the place they are today, and maybe even because of. So I am thrilled to be able to be here with you and introduce you to Susan Caperso, And she is a wife and mother of two young boys who unexpectedly was thrust into a world of overwhelming chaos and disbelief. A two-year roller coaster ride led her down a road filled with discovery and a vision to take away your fear of the unknown. She is an end-of-life doula, legacy creator, and author. During the last 15 months, she has published two books and an ebook, helping others leave their thumbprint in the world through creative legacy and guided individuals and their families during their own end of life journey, spiritually, emotionally, practically, and holistically. She'll be sharing today her journey and what, her, what brought her to the work she's now doing. Welcome, Susan. Hi, good morning, Nancy. Thank you for having me today. Oh, it's my pleasure to 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 have you here. And when I, you know, you and I have known each other for about a year and a half now. And when I think about the journey that you were on that brought you to this place, like how you really, you know, turned something tragic into something that allows you to not only triumph for yourself, but taking those lessons uh, to other people. So share with our listeners a little bit about what happened here. Okay, so uh, just a few years back, I worked a corporate job and I'm at work and I get a phone call from my husband and he says, I think I have the flu. And, you know, thinking back, I thought he was very dramatic in ways. You know, he was six foot eight, 300 pounds. But yet when men get sick, right, they get very squeamish and babyish. So I said, just get under the covers. Um, I'll pick you up some medicine from CVS on the way home. That's what I did. I get home, he's under the blankets, he's shivering. Uh, 24 hours go by, he says to me, I I can't do this. I'm gonna have to go to the hospital. This was Saturday night. We go into the emergency room. Uh, They ended up putting, he was tested positive for the flu. So they put him on many meds in the inhaler and we go home thinking in the next few days he'll get better. By Tuesday, he called me at work and he says, I'm not getting better, this is getting worse. I said, well, I'll come home, take a hot shower. Maybe that will help with the steam. I'll bring you in tomorrow morning. I'll stay home from work if you're not better. So again, another day is is delayed. But we woke up the next morning and he couldn't quite make it to the kitchen. And he asked me to call 911. So now I'm thinking, oh my gosh, 300 pounds, a big guy with 911 coming. This is going to be so dramatic, right? The woman, the woman in you. Um, we called, 911 came, they took him into the ambulance. I live six miles up the road from a major university hospital. Within 10 minutes, he was intubated. They told me within the half hour that they didn't think he'd make it through the night. Yes, he had the flu, but his lungs were, were caving, his lungs. So you're in shock. You know, this is, you know, the weight of the world is now here. Um, Very scary time. My boys were there as well. How old were your boys at the time? 18 and 23. Yeah, young and um, wow. I guess he was graduating high school in in two months and no more than two months, about five months, four or five months because this was January 21st that we went in. So lo and behold, he was intubated they only were able to take that out of him for 24 hours and he needed the oxygen again he asked for it to be put back in he couldn't breathe so that was for 55 days while we stayed in the hospital together Mm -hmm. Uh, on day 55 my i never went home i slept there they were nice enough to have a nice chair for me there and i showered in the bathroom but on day 55 about four hours before he passed, they told me he was going going to pass away. Now he had just been through an experimental treatment and we're all excited. We're thinking that this is going to work. Death was not in my mind. 
at the moment, at that moment. And I said, what? Well, they pinpointed it down to four hours. Wow. And my anxiety about this really was, well, I could put my own feelings aside, right? I've been dealing with it for 55 days now. But what am I going to tell my boys? They're on their way down here. What do I tell them about the details of, of what's about to happen? Mm -hmm. And this was frightening because I was so lucky and blessed in my life not to have experienced death. Um, at all in my life. I never saw anybody die. I was about to now, the man I was married to for 25 years. What am I going to tell his kids? So I wanted to know, was he going to convulse? Was he going to foam at the mouth? Like I needed to know those little tiny details so I could feel safe in telling them when they walk through the room that this is going to happen now, this will happen next, and we'll be okay. But I needed to know. Now the nurse that was on duty hadn't experienced much death you could tell she was very young and that's that's okay you know that's she she wasn't experienced so let but me let me pause for a second and ask you a question here because yeah. um it's something i hadn't thought about either like you know what am, what if, especially if you have the the possibility or opportunity to be there with him through the process like you're going to be a witness to those last things that happen and in addition to the grief that you're experiencing you could be scared and shocked by what the body physically may go through is what i'm hearing yes that was that was very good foresight on your part especially for your children oh sure yeah sure and to me that was the scariest thing i needed to know now the details now what were we about to walk through? Mm -hmm. Because if I knew, like, you know, a recipe, right? You have your guidance and you have the support to make you make that beautiful cake at the end. Right. I had no recipe. I had no, no it's support. Unexpected. Yeah. It, it's kind of like if you say, and, and it can be calming to know what's coming. Oh, sure. Right. And, oh, and sure. Um, it takes yeah, away so, that anxiety. Yeah. yeah. I even, you know, it's a strange analogy perhaps, but like when you get in an airplane, if the pilot comes on and says, hey folks, we're gonna be experiencing some turbulence, I'm gonna get us up to a higher al al altitude, we're gonna suspend, like even though I don't like what's coming, I know right. what's coming, so it's calmer, right? Exactly, Same kind of thing. exact scenario. So here's me, right? Now I understand it was five o'clock and six o'clock in the morning, but I'm looking for somebody to give me that guidance. Mm -hmm. So I, I walked in and out of the room. I walked up and down the hallway. I'm looking for a doctor, a nurse. I'm looking for anybody just to, to give me a little bit of guidance, to tell me what's going to happen. My boys were on their way. I'm getting more scared and frightened right. as the moments are going by, right? There was nobody. Okay, they didn't send anybody to sit with me. They didn't send anybody just to answer my questions. And if anything, if they couldn't answer my questions, well, you know what, sit next to me and hold my hand and say, listen, you've got this. You've got this. You have to be no, here. The, the hospital didn't have anybody to be with you, huh? Absolutely not. So what happened thereafter? My boys came, my, my son put his hole through a cement wall. I mean, the events were horrible, as anybody can expect. But what happened thereafter is we went home. I had to go back to work in a few weeks. And in the next 24 months, I encountered 14 more deaths in my life. Wow. 14 more. So they were close people in my life. I don't know how this happened, why this happened, but we're talking my mother, my sister, who was 10 years younger than me. My brother, who was four years younger than me, um, friends, my cousin, my two neighbors across the way, although they were 99 each, but I spent the last 20 years with them, right. you know, visiting them at night. They were very close relationships. My uncle, my aunt, there, there were 14 altogether, my in-laws. And what I noticed was there was something not being done right. We yeah. could do dying better. And you can't always do this when there's a, a tragedy, right? Uh, hold on a second. Yeah. I love what you just said. We could be dying better. 
Of course. Like if you, if we really, you know, we all know death is a, is a certainty at some point in time. That's right. And perhaps some of the fear and unknowns around what the experience when our time actually comes, if that could be lessened and um, wow, we could die better. Oh yeah. Wow. So could continue. <laughs> well, this is what, with the a large number of deaths I was seeing, this is what I'm thinking in the back of my head that some things, we can be doing this a lot better and something's not right. So yes, for the person who may have a car accident or, you know, dies tragically, there's no way to pre-plan that. Right, the sudden but, experience. But yeah. if you see even many, many professions right now, they're, you know, attorneys, elder care attorneys, uh, there are many professions that are teaching you um, how to pre-plan different things to make it easier mm -hmm. later on for you and, and your family. So my job was very stressful. I worked a corporate job and I used to come home crying twice a week. Mm -hmm. uh, my head was in spreadsheets all week long and here I've been creative my entire life and didn't know what to do with that. And meanwhile, you've been thrust upon the experience of grief and loss. And I wasn't having a chance to even mourn myself. Yeah. But I was making it through and life was snowballing and I was going through one of, you know, I was waiting to see who was going to go next. This was not a, a good thing. Right. So I remember coming home one day and I was crying and I said, I, I just, I can't do this anymore. And how my life has got to change in some way, shape or form. So I Googled, I love Mr. Google, and I, I always tell this story because it's the truth and it's a fact. And I Googled, what are the 10 top peaceful professions in the next decade in the United States? I get detailed with my Googles because- That's really good. The answers you're looking for. Yeah. And number one came up was a Money Magazine article with the top 10 peaceful professions in the United States in the next decade. And number seven was end of life doula. End of life doula, um, and that began your inquiry and journey. Like that's right. Uh, so and everything so snowballed. I, you know, something happened at work that day. Yes, to make me cry, and I feel like it was God really who set me on that. Open the Google. <laughs> <laughs> but after that, everything I feel like came to me. It was came coming to me every single day. Another little piece. Another little piece. Another little piece. So after about a year and a half of studying and certifying, I um, gave my notice at work. I had things in place. Mm -hmm. I knew how I wanted to take the leap, but I knew that I had to have things like a website and marketing material. And mm -hmm. people had never heard of this profession before. Right. So I knew it was going to be a, an uphill climb to teach, educate, and let people know. We've been nationally recognized um, last year as being um, an adjunct to the hospice and medical teams. Beautiful. So within the next two years, I know every household will know what an end of life doula is. Well, and, and uh, you know, I've had the privilege of working with you pretty close to the time that you launched this business. And since then, you've been recognized in several newspapers, interviews, TV shows, radio shows, uh, your book, uh, uh, Remember Me, isn't that the name of what? Tell me, tell your book was like Remember actually me? something the that was, birthed, my life. yeah, this that was birthed from you. It was like, okay, I need to have people do this. Um, you have made such an impact in the lives of so many, and learning about what's coming is a piece of what you do as an end of life doula. The other piece on the legacy side that you're doing, like it all just blended together to create a richer experience of our relationships right now and sure. for the future. So t tell about the book, how people can get in touch with you. And I'm sure you've got lots of ways to work with people and trainings online and you know, you can work right. with Thank you. So I've had to I've had to separate the two because I started doing a lot of legacy work. Mm -hmm. um, legacy work meaning this leaving your stories, leaving important memories in history for future um, for future generations. And I do this with end of life clients. However, I was being approached by baby boomers who said I have a story and I'm healthy and I'm not going anywhere. 
So I needed to separate it because when people heard end of life, they were getting a little bit nervous saying that's not me. So for the legacy piece, it's a book. It's um, the story of your life. Uh, it's all blank pages. I just give you prompts to get you going and you complete the book on your own. Mm -hmm. Uh, that you can find at the Legacy Doula, D O U L A dot com, or on Amazon. It's on both. And it's Remember Me, the Story of My Life. That's that part of it. Um, that I put together really quickly to use as a tool because people needed to do this for their mm -hmm. future families, right? Mm -hmm. But most recently, um, it's with the editor now, so hopefully it'll be very shortly, this will be finished. Um, I put together Coming Full Circle when the diagnosis is terminal. Mm. This book is powerful and profound in that it's for the person that gets that specific diagnosis in their life and has a window. And a lot of people that get that diagnosis have four months, six months, eight months, or even a year, but don't know what to do. Right. And they're afraid and they're frightened and they, they don't know the pieces to put into place. Um, the creative part, of course. So I leave a hundred tools, tips, projects, and ideas that you can bring into your life for you and for your family mm -hmm. for after they're gone. And you know what, Nancy, it changes the whole trajectory of the grieving process. Yeah. Because if you put some of these things into place now, and you're talking deeply to your family members and leaving them these letters and audios and videos and cards and gifting. These are all the things that are in the book. If you do it now, when you leave, I don't know how to explain it. It's, so, it's not so much as they're bitter and they're, they're angry. And yeah, they're sad. You're, using, you're losing somebody you love so much, but it's, it's a calming, more peaceful, because I still have a piece of you. That's right. Many pieces of you. Or I, That's right. Um, and people they, can't think outside of the box, though. And there was a, in their families to do I can't the remember, the, There was a movie. I can't remember the name of it. Um, with Gerard Butler, maybe? And oh, yeah. The Ireland. Reason. Yeah. Well, and, yeah. and he knew he was passing and he like pre-planned sending something on the next birthday or things like that. And, and those are the things I do as a doula. I love it. But I thought, Nancy, I thought, you know, I have my incredible invisible toolbox of a hundred things. Why don't I share it with the world? So globally, uh -huh. individuals can help themselves and their families to do this whole scary thing better. Well, make sure you let us know when the book is um, available and we'll definitely share it. Thank you so much for being with us and sharing your, your story today, for also trusting yourself that in you know, everything you experienced and then what you were then experiencing being unhappy in your work, you got to a, a breaking point where you said there must be something better. Hey, Google. <laughs> Yeah, I love Mr. Google. <laughs> Is he a mister? I'm not sure. I don't know. I don't know either, but... <laughs> There's a lot there. Anyway, Susan, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank I you for having me, Nancy. You're welcome. Uh, to all of our audience, thank you for joining us. Be sure to connect with Susan at thelegacydoula.com. And you can also get to her um, main doula website from there as well. I appreciate you tuning in as we share real stories of real women making a positive impact in the world. Until next time, this is Nancy Matthews. Get out there and be the one. Bye, everybody. Bye, Susan. Bye. Thank you.